with a material scientist. Uh, this is definitely a challenge that I tackled here at MIT. And uh, I will talk about antiquity-inspired uh, innovation. And uh, before I start, I will ask you to download this app if you manage. By the way, we do have also something printed out that you might use to download. Because there was this uh, augmented reality in the t title of my session. And so I was kind of challenged to push that uh, aspect of my work. In any case, uh, um, while you are downloading this, I hope it's enough for everyone. If not, you can use uh, probably screens. Are the screens projecting this over there? Yeah? OK, good. So um, let me start with uh, um, talking about antiquity inspired the concept, or, or also um, paleo inspired if you study fossils as well. Um, now, uh, we do realize that there are materials in our past that uh, carry some uh, interesting properties. And uh, these properties somehow uh, and often are uh, so appealing to us uh, and uh, we would like to reproduce those in our labs and often we fail. And this is exactly where my lab uh, is focusing, is exploring ancient samples, uh, uh, fruit of uh, generations uh, and uh, centuries of uh, optimization and uh, uh, kind of uh, trial and error uh, uh, optimization process to then uh, use modern tools, and this is where MIT Nano is extremely excited for us, uh, to somehow unlock these secrets, unlock uh, features and properties that perhaps uh, are of interest to, to inspire and so future, but also basically translate some of these features into our modern world. And uh, uh, the great example uh, in this uh, domain is Roman concrete. We, we do realize that these two buildings were quite similar aesthetically. <laughs> uh, the, uh, we know about Pantheon that was built 2,000 years ago and uh, is made out of concrete entirely, and is there after 2,000 years of weathering, okay? So we don't know how long will last our dome here at MIT, but considering uh, best estimations, uh, we might talk about uh, guaranteeing 150, 200 years of uh, performance, and then perhaps it's gonna degrade. This is, we are talking about ordinary Portland cement. So, so the question is uh, how, oops, I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, okay, here. So how this building uh, was able to resist to all the earthquakes in Rome and everything that happened uh, uh, in 2000 years. Uh, the secrets looks like uh, uh, are at the different scales and we are basically uh, asked to explore most of the scales, including nano and, macro, um, and molecular level interactions of uh, phases in a very complex mix. I mean, we are talking about a cement, uh, and it's extremely challenging with uh, everything that we have available right now to understand phase transformations, you know, just hydration processes. So that's a great example, but interestingly, there are many other examples around the world that might serve as a source of inspiration. We are talking about uh, uh, Egyptian blue, uh, Mayans developed a really an amazing uh, uh, blue pigment that uh, holds its durability into this interaction between uh, indigo from our genes and, uh, and the polygorskite is the clay that, uh, that serves as a, uh, uh, channels and groves, grooves on the surface to then uh, Create, protect the indigo from degradation. Uh, I don't know if you read recently, we published a paper on ancient production of a temple scroll, one of the most beautiful uh, uh, scrolls uh, uh, that were found in Dead Sea area, so Dead Sea scrolls. That's a quite interesting uh, uh, sample. Of course, our future is not in uh, scroll making, <laughs> but uh, definitely it might uh, serve as an inspiration in terms of preservation of what we have there. And these 2,000 years old uh, manuscript made out of collagen, 
uh, actually are very vulnerable and could degrade in very uh, uh, near future. So we do use that knowledge to preserve those manuscripts. As I said, uh, uh, I'll focus on Egyptian blue. Egyptian blue is such a beautiful blue pigment. By the way, Egyptians uh, came out up with this pigment uh, 5,000 years ago. Uh, it's one of the first uh, synthetic pigments we ever made, at least to our knowledge. And they said we had enough of this uh, lapis lazuli. I don't know if you are familiar with lapis lazuli, but it was really precious pigment because there was one, one kind of query somewhere in Afghanistan that was carried to the ancient wall. And so they said, okay, we need to come up with something that uh, we don't pay all that money to paint our beautiful objects. And so Egyptian blue uh, uh, is the fruit of this uh, need, uh, technological need to have a blue pigment. And they took sand, uh, they took uh, uh, natron that is very, uh, uh, very frequently found in the area and some source of copper uh, turns out that they could uh, even use brass or other uh, sources of copper to then create this pigment that I will be focusing on today. So, interestingly also, uh, Vitruvius and Romans in general generally translated some of the knowledge uh, into their world uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, documents that uh, testify this are many, one that I want to stress today is this work by Vitruvius. In this case, he's showing uh, his uh, uh, result, uh, his uh, paper, uh, paper, let's call it paper, book, 10 books uh, of architecture uh, to Augustus in this case. Uh, uh, and Vitruvius did uh, only one thing. He went around and collected all the technologies and wrote how you would make Roman concrete, and he also documented how you would make uh, Egyptian blue in the book number seven, I guess. Uh, and uh, so um, that's basically really a need to have because uh, uh, we have a document that is 2,000 years old. It's not document, it's the reprint uh, of his work that then Leonardo uh, actually studied uh, to make his uh, version of, uh, of uh, Vitruvian man. Vitruvian man is exactly the man that that uh, Leonardo is describing uh, inspired by this work from uh, Vitruvius. Anyways, uh, so we had the recipe and uh, this is exactly what uh, then uh, we started to use uh, for Roman concrete or Egyptian blue. It turns out that sometimes these recipes are not so complete in terms of Roman concrete. Uh, in case of Roman concrete, probably there were some adjustments that we should make. Anyways, this is not a topic. I like to talk a lot uh, but I will show you this video that shows a little bit the story of Egyptian blue. And it's kind of a beautiful story. As I said, it's a synthetic pigment, uh, one of the first synthetic pigments, probably the first one. And uh, 5,000 years ago, fake lapis. It's very beautiful and uh, um, it's something that um, attracted, of course, uh, interest in terms of uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, and uh, was rediscovered, uh, uh, of course, following the Vitruvius uh, work. I'm sorry, this green laser and green uh, thing is not helpful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was uh, about to use the laser, but okay, so here. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. All right, so. So it uh, turns out that uh, uh, Egyptian blue has also very interesting properties. It absorbs invisible and emits in infrared. The property that is basically something that we uh, are very much interested in and you will learn uh, why. Uh, so uh, enjoy the video. I don't know if you can read at all on the screens. As a text, I can say something. So Sir Davy uh, reproduced the pigment eventually in 19th century, uh, a, little, a little bit altering the chemistry, of course, uh, following Vitruvius. He, uh, instead of uh, sand, uh, he put a little bit purer silica as a starting point. Uh, instead of natron, he used sodium carbonate and copper source. In general, he used malachite, the pigment. 
amalekite. And then what you need to do is mix nicely these components and then uh, put it in the oven, cook it for a while. We, we do it generally overnight. And uh, basically you end up, uh, 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 temperature is around 900 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then you end up with this amazing pigment. Unfortunately, light, there's too much light here. It's really great pigment. Oh, look at this, that's great. So blue pigment, but this pigment now absorbs in all invisible and emits in infrared. Now, if you take a camera and a filter for infrared, this is what comes out. Only Egyptian blue visualized. Uh, and so what we do with students, we go around the museum and picture with this camera, with a filter, normal camera, and find Egyptian blue everywhere. But then uh, if you think about the concept of translating this uh, property into something usable, many applications come in. Turns out that cuproriverite, that is the molecule, is also uh, two-dimensional material if you exfoliate it nicely, so it's nano, two-dimensional material. You see fingerprints, very easy. You just put the filter in the camera and nano and spread the powder of uh, Egyptian blue and the fingerprints are very well seen. Turns out to be antibacterial uh, as well, uh, application that you can find. And this is now, it's happening. We do believe that the property that uh, uh, turning a visible light into infrared might uh, allow us to improve the solar cell technology and uh, use it as a as a kind of a material that, uh, that, that increases the efficiency of these, uh, of these uh, uh, applications. But I mentioned that I will talk about uh, AR, and this brings me to this box here. So uh, when, we, when we basically um, connected with the Egyptian uh, uh, Museum in Turin, uh, they, asked, they, they said that we are uh, interested in something that uh, would allow our visitors to explore deeper and have a better experience of the museum. And uh, um, what, what this uh, kind of uh, uh, led to is a collection of a lot of data that are generally multispectral data. Now probably you imagine where I'm going but uh, multispectral data on the objects. And this is an exa example of this beautiful uh, uh, um, box found in the tomb of Ka. And Ka was another architect. This is funny, my talk is full of architects today. Uh, but in Egyptian uh, time, 3,000 uh, years ago. And, uh, and uh, so I will uh, show you another video that visualizes a little bit the, the moment of discovery. They reconstructed the the tomb at the moment where Ernesto Schiaparelli, Italian uh, uh, Egyptologist, discovered this, uh, this tomb. many objects were found. Uh, basically what the architect and his wife uh, took uh, with uh, in the other world. And uh, many objects, uh, 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 as I said, so this burial assemblage uh, uh, are right now preserved in the uh, Egyptian Museum in Turin because of Scaparelli's work. And um, this is uh, how the tomb looked like. And it's all three-dimensional reconstructed. Uh, which is quite, quite nice. So you see how these objects were carried uh, uh, from the tomb and then stored in the Queen's well, Valley of the Queens to protect and then turned uh, in Egyptian Museum in Turin in Italy. And if you look carefully at this picture here, you will notice what? I need to be careful with it. Look at these nice boxes. Uh, and one of those is indeed the one that I presented to you. But what we wanted to have in, uh, from this work is actually explore beyond the visible. The, uh, the, the, the exhibit was uh, 
uh, invisible archaeology as a title. And so what you can do, you can actually expand the spectrum of the light uh, uh, and not only consider visible light, but also UV and other lights. And uh, basically, the same uh, box now has uh, different uh, features. Features that, uh, uh, I don't know, if you do X-ray uh, spectroscopy here, you get uh, pigments. If you do what? Visible induced luminescence, you get only Egyptian blue visualized. So now we are going to do uh, that exercise. You have the app running or not? Not yet. OK. So the challenge was to download the app while I was talking. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it should work on the, on the things. Projected is difficult. But what you can do and take with you the card and uh, explore the uh, beauty of, of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this box uh, uh, through different uh, view, through different lights. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, that's the AR applications that we developed for the museum, the Egyptian Museum, together with the MIT Virtual Experience Design Lab, uh, especially with uh, Chari Zaman. And uh, I need to, uh, you see, acknowledge many people uh, the lab also developed the uh, MIT Nano uh, work that you will be seeing uh, later, or you already see? It, it's later, okay. And, uh, and yeah, many people to acknowledge, and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention.